Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Office Hours. Uh, we are the Federal General Supervision and Monitoring Team. And these are our bi-monthly, oh, Robin is here, excellent. Um, and these are our bi-monthly office hours. And just a reminder that we have our Q&A session, which is like an open drop-in forum um, for folks um, just to come in and ask questions as needed on Friday from 1130 to 12. So we invite you to join us um, for that as well. Um, with me here today from my team are Julie Pelletier and Carly Thibodeau. Do you guys want to come along and say hello? Sure, I'll go first. I'm Carly Thibodeau. I joined the team in July, and before that, I was an educator for 21 years. Julie Pelletier, I'm the admin support for the monitoring team, and I've been with the DOE for um, six years. Fantastic, and I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Leora. But also from the from the ESOL team, from the main Department of Education, we have Robin Fleck with us. She is one of the consultants who works um, with the main Department of Education, specifically with um, multilingual learners. Robin, do you wanna come on and say hello? Hi everyone, glad to thank you for the invitation to be here. Awesome, thank you so much. So this is us right here. Jennifer Gleason and Colette Sullivan are also on the monitoring team and they are not with us today. Here is our contact information. We love it when people reach out with questions. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, as you go through the special education process, uh, we know that there's a, a pretty steep learning curve and we are here to help you. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, Carly, can you drop in the chat box the link to the procedural manual and Muser? Yes, I will do please. that. Thank you. So as many of you know, the procedural manual um, is the um, guide for all of the required special education documentation in Maine. And it goes through every single one of those required documents and tells you how to fill out or what we're looking for for each section. So that is a great resource if you are somebody who fills out um, required documentation for special education. And also Carly is putting in uh, the link to Muser, the Maine Unified Special Education Regulation, birth to age 20. Um, this is also chapter 101, and these are Maine special education laws based on IDEA, of course, which is the federal um, language and laws related to special education. Um, and this is the basis for everything that we do in Maine related to special education. So that's the why piece of things. So today we're going to go over the multilingual learner manual. It's, it's a guidebook about how to identify, evaluate, and partner with your the ESOL folks in your district when you have a multilingual learner who you suspect may have a disability or who does have a disability. So the guidance manual was developed in response to the field asking for this guidance. Other states ha already had guidance manuals and this manual was, um, it was worked on with outside partners to make sure that the guidance is the most up-to-date available. Robin, do you want to say anything anything related to the development of, of the guidebook? Only that, like, like Leora said, it was in response to so many questions coming from the field, and we did have it reviewed by um, MASP and uh, Dr. Melissa Cuba up at um, UMO, and uh, we had uh, other outside partners that collaborated with us. And it's the design of it was based on the design that Virginia created their handbook on, and we did get their permission um, to use their organization um, in presenting the information. 
Perfect. Thank you, Robin. Um, we we partnered with the ESOL folks so that we could um, make sure that the manual is aligned to Muser. So you'll notice in the guidebook that there are citations to Muser and that um, is to help orient folks to that why piece about why are we, why do we need to do, um, you know, certain steps in the process? Because as, as we know, not all ESOL folks are familiar with special education and vice versa. So there's a learning curve on, on both ends. So we would just note that Maine has transitioned to the use of the term multilingual learners. Um, we are transitioning to that language because it's more asset-based ba asset language. Um, it is not a change that's happening at a federal level. So Maine is ahead of the pack in that, which I'm always proud of us when we go above and beyond. Um, so we are now referring to English learners as multilingual learners or MLs. Um, but again, just keep in mind that the federal government is still going to be using the term English learners. So this is the this is some information that Robin just went over. Um, you know, we did a lot of collaboration, and you can see that um, these are some of the folks that um, Robin was just talking about who looked over the manual to make sure that they were in agreement. Um, and it was also looked at by MASP, the Maine Association of School Psychologists, um, as well, again, to ensure that the guidance being given to the field is in alignment um, with, with the most up-to-date information and um, that it is um, the best guide that we could put together to support folks in the situation where that overlap of multilingual learner and special education um, comes together. Robin, did you want to add anything to that piece? Well, I'll just blow our horn a little bit, Leora, and share that Sylvia DeRuvo from the National Center for Systemic Improvement um, gave Maine kudos uh, nice. for this handbook and, and said it was um, one of the most complete and detailed that uh, she had seen. That is quite a compliment because she she works on the national level, so she sees all of them, really. Right. So that's pretty, that's wonderful. Um, these are the contents of the manual itself. We go over the legal requirements, intervention procedures, comprehensive, evalu comprehensive evaluation of multilingual learners, and that specifically um, includes a piece called dynamic assessment, which is where we really asked MASP to give their um, input to make sure that, that the guidance that we were giving in the manual was consistent with the guidance that they um, give and their what their practices are when they're evaluating as well. Um, there are questions and answers about evaluation, how to determine eligibility, how to develop an IEP. There are instructional considerations. There are um, there's information about effective communication with parents and guardians. There's a section about frequently asked questions and answers, case studies, there are definitions, and there is a robust section of resources for folks. Um, so I encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to look over the manual, to take a peek at it. Um, and we are available, um, as is Robin, if you have any questions. But today we're going to go over. So Robin and I have done four presentations on the manual thus far. We, we did one at MADSEC in the fall, and we have done three, like parts one, two, and three of the manual specific, specifically to the audience of ESOL teachers. Um, and this, of course, is our office hours for special education. And what I did was just put together the three um, slide decks that Robin and I have used for those other presentations. So um, 
if you have come to one of those, there's going to be a little bit of a repeat here, but I really wanted to make sure that special education folks had the same um, baseline of information that we've given to the other groups. So the legal requirements that the guidebook follows, it's compliant with IDEA law and regulations, it's compliant with MUSER, it's compliant with federal civil rights law and guidance, and it's compliant with Every Student Succeeds, ESSA, of 2015. So one thing that we come across periodically in the field is that there was this I want to call it an old wives tale, but I know that that's that there's probably a better term for it now. There was a misinterpretation in the field for a period of time, a long period of time, that we still run across periodically that in order to refer a multilingual learner for special education evaluation, that there had to be a set amount of waiting period for the child to acclimate into the school setting. Um, we've heard that that period can be years, two years, et cetera. That is not the case. Um, if you suspect that one of your ESOL students might also have a disability, you can encourage the parents to make a referral. You as an interested party who knows the student can make a referral. So there's no such thing as this, this waiting period um, that was thought to be a common practice for a period of time in Maine. Robin, anything to add to that? Well, quite often the people that were um, thinking about that myth said, well, if they don't speak English, how can we evaluate them? And so we can evaluate them um, through the use of um, interpreters, sometimes translated materials, sometimes um, nonverbal assessments. Um, there are ways to for evaluators to complete um, you know, a, a full evaluation, even if the student has um, no English. So dispel that myth too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's a question in the chat box about where the guidebook is actually found, and it's on the main Department of Education website. Um, it's, it's on the ESOL page, if I'm correct, Robin, is that right? Yes, it's on the Multilingual Learner website, and if you click on Multilingual Learner Resources uh, and scroll down, then you'll see a box where it says um, Multilingual Learners with Identified Disabilities or with Learning Disabilities, and, and just click on that and the link is there. Thank can, you very much. Yep. Okay, so we're going to talk briefly about intervention procedures for suspected disability evaluation and eligibility. So there is a myth in the field that students will acquire a language just by being exposed to it. Um, and of course, um, students acquire social language in order to be able to interact with their peers, but academic language has to be taught. We can't just assume that because the students are, are picking up language from their peers, that they're, they're picking up the academic piece of that language as well. Um, in chapter six of the US Department of Education's English Learner Toolkit, there are four potential factors that could contribute to the misidentification of special education needs and learning disabilities among students who are multilingual learners. The first one is poor instructional practices. The second one um, is the evaluating professional's lack of knowledge base regarding second language development and disabilities. The third are weak intervention strategies, and the fourth is our inappropriate assessment tools. Each of those factors is addressed in the intervention procedure section of the guide. So um, when the guide was written, these factors of misidentification were addressed. 
Uh, Robin, do you want to add anything to that? Yes. So again, sometimes districts do have to really look at what a specific instruction a student has had. Uh, sometimes districts, um, for a variety of reasons, um, have not had uh, research-based intervention strategies or had certified uh, teachers, um, teachers with the uh, 660 endorsement working with students, um, students who are just having an assistant teacher working with them. Uh, and when we look at appropriate assessment tools, uh, you know, just basing a student's uh, learning progress on an English-based standardized test may not be the best measurement um, of their um, abilities. Uh, thank you. There, there's also something to keep in mind as well is that there are linguistic differences between languages, right? Um, the way languages develop, um, especially with younger children. So what you, we just want to be careful when we're looking at those differences that it is um that we're not take that we need to take into account that different languages develop at different rates and those and that linguistic issues um are common with young children and that they are a, an expected part of language development and we are I might just add that Yes, um, yes. We refer to our four-year-olds who are sort of multilingual learners, but in the field, we refer to them as dual language learners Ooh, because yeah. at age four, um, you know, one has not fully developed uh, their language skills in, in any language. Uh, but there can be an abundance of referrals to speech. Uh, because of those linguistic differences that you just talked about. Uh, so it is important with our dual language learners um, that the teacher, and if there's um, a referral to speech, that there um, is some research on what the linguistic differences are and really important that parent interview piece to find out from the parents if they understand their child when they're speaking, if the, the child um, did develop a uh, speech in what would be an expected timeline, all those good questions um, that can occur during the parent interview. Perfect. So there are some things to look out for, some indicators that would tell you that a student is experiencing challenge, challenges in their learning. If the learner is not acquiring English at an expected pace, if they're not making academic progress, or if they're regularly exhibiting inappropriate behavior. So educators need to determine whether the issue is caused by a learning disability, difficulty in developing second language skills, trauma, cultural adjustment. Um, some, of, some of our new um, learners who come in haven't been part of structured education for a period of time, if at all. So there are interruptions to that learning as well. And I'm sure that Robin can give us some more information. Those learners that Lior is referring to, there's an acronym called SLIFE, S-L-I-F-E, um, Students with Limited or Interrupted Formal Education. And there is criteria um, to determine if a student um, falls under that life status. And actually, uh, we've just written a release with a state definition. So stay tuned. Hopefully, that will be coming out to you in a newsroom announcement uh, in the upcoming weeks. Um, but that certainly is a factor when you are looking at a student who is experiencing these challenges. And also the trauma, I can't emphasize enough the how trauma can affect a person 
so that it looks like they have a significant disability um, and they may need support around um, because of the trauma, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have a learning disability. Absolutely true. Yep. So these are questions that should be thought about and responded to before a referral is made for special education. Um, is the district ESOL plan being implemented within the school? So are, are the, the teachers implementing that plan, um, you, you know, with the regular, um, you know, classroom expectations? Is the student's ILAT, the Individual Learning Acquisition Plan, inclusive of language goals and benchmarks? And is it available to all educational staff? You know, that plan has a lot of great information in it that all of the teachers who were working with that student could benefit from knowing. Are the modifications, adapt adaptations, or differentiation strategies within the ILAP being used? Is that plan being used with fidelity? That's another question. And, and we do acknowledge that there are staffing shortages and there are, um, in some districts, there are many more students coming in with higher needs. Um, so we understand that. Um, the other piece is that if you are an ESOL um, teacher or staff member, you should have a plan for how to share that information, like the ILAP information, with the rest of the folks who are working with your students. Um, if it's an electronic version, that's a great way that you can share that information easily. Um, and you could also um, consider providing um, guidance or, you know, professional development, technical assistance with your colleagues so that they know how to read the ILAP and how to implement it with fidelity. Robin, what do you want to add to that piece? I just want to add that your ESOL plan referred to as the LAO plan is part of school policy and it's in your school policies handbook. And usually teachers have to sign off that they've read that, you know, 60 page document. Uh, but unless it affects you, um, it's kind of one of those things that you just sort of skim through maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when the ESOL teacher said, well, it's in our LAO plan that we have a language assessment committee meeting and the classroom teacher says, oh, what? <laughs> so just keep in mind, it is policy. It does have to be updated as the um, regulations, the federal laws and regulations um, get changed occasionally. Uh, and they do have to be submitted for review and then voted on by your school boards. And how long, how, how often should that be reviewed, Robin? Well, typically we recommend that a district review their LAO plan if there's been a federal change okay. uh, or a state change. Like right now, if a district was reviewing their LAO plan, we would encourage them to uh, switch over to multilingual learners mm -hmm. since the state has adopted that language. We wouldn't ask someone to rewrite their plan, but everything's electronic, so you could go in and change that. Um, but otherwise, every three to five years. Okay. Okay. So some other some other um, considerations as you question whether or not a child should be referred is if the student is being taught by somebody who is certified um, in, in ESOL or teachers trained in specific strategies that target the needs of multilingual learners while they're learning their content, knowledge, and skills. So are they getting those ESOL services at the same time as they're getting sort of their, their general education? Um, is the student demonstrating progress on the annual English language proficiency assessment? 
Have teachers been regularly meeting to discuss the progress and implementing specific interventions to target the areas of need? So those are all um, pieces of the puzzle to put together as well and consider if you're questioning um, that a multilingual learner may have a disability. And the annual English language proficiency assessment is called ACCESS. And right now we are heading towards the end of the ACCESS testing window. It closes the first week of March. Uh, those test scores usually won't be sent out until the first week of May. Uh, and there is an English language progress indicator um, it's a formula, and the state, uh, oh, I'm not quite sure the right word, but the, the pe people that figure it out, the data people, mm -hmm. they send a report to each district, okay, that shows the district if the student made expected progress, and there's like an expected timeline based on each year's scores. So a student might um, do um, go above and beyond what the expectation was. And so then it's reset for the next year, okay? With the hope being that um, in five years, a student might be exiting. But if you are not seeing um, that a student is making progress on these annual assessments, if they're flatlining, that is a, definitely a red flag and something that um, should be considered. And so special educators should be aware that these are standardized tests designed for multilingual learners and should be looked at in, um, when evaluating a student. And I also just wanna mention here that many of our ESOL teachers in the state, particularly our um, rural areas, travel to a variety of communities in a region. And so it's really hard quite often to invite an ESOL teacher to um, a meeting um, to talk about progress, but it's so important to have that person at the table. Um, and it, quite often those people are forgotten. And I just wanna highlight how critical it is to include them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they bring the expertise about the ESOL world to the table. And if there's, you know, in looking at the multilingual learner through that lens, that is an invaluable, that is invaluable knowledge that um, the rest of the folks who work with that student can use um, to better program for the student. Um, okay. So we wanna make sure that parents are invited to give background information. So Robin was just referring to the parent interview. That is hugely important because they know the child better than anybody else, right? Um, so they're able to give insight into um, what the student is able to do in the home, which is of course a much different setting, right? So that parent interview is, is very important. Um, the other piece that you could also look at are medical records. Has the child had recent, you know, well child visits with screening and vision and hearing and things like that, just to rule out any, any of those um, issues that may be contributing to difficulty in learning. Um, have student assets been identified based on progress monitoring and informal observations and assessments? What can the child, what can the child do really well? And can that be leveraged into other areas of the child's education? And of course, considering cultural factors, um, where is the child in their acquisition process? And are they being taught in a culturally responsive environment? Um, um, those are, you know, all considerations that um, are, are building blocks, really, of getting to know the student, who they are at a more, uh, a, at a more basic core level than what we might just see on the surface in a classroom. And I just would chime in that like, when we're talking about cultural factors, there are some cultures where 
even to wear glasses, it's it, it, there's a stigma to it. Uh, and so in, in my own personal experience in working with students and families, um, a child needed glasses and particularly a girl um, that they didn't want that stigma that that culture attached to the glasses. I didn't want the, the girl to have the glasses and, and the girl really had a significant need for them and, and so wasn't making progress. Um, in, 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 in reading and, and having a very hard time overall. Um, so we really had to work hard with that family to, you know, try to equate if your daughter had a broken arm, you would let, allow her to have a cast to help the arm heal. Well, the, the glasses are allowing the eyes to do the job they're meant to do. Mm -hmm. trying to come up with various ways um, so that that student could have what they needed. Um, and also wanted to make mention that there is an acculturation checklist within uh, um, a link, you know, showing you where to go. So it's just sort of a checklist that when a student arrives, you sort of check where they are. And then, you know, maybe at end of trimester, you look at it again. and it's just a quick checklist and then look at it again next semester. And the idea is, is if you are not seeing those categories move and the student is, you know, making progress within that process that you need to look a little more carefully about why isn't that happening? What does that student need? Great, thank you, Robin. So MTSS, as much as there is not um, a formal waiting period to refer a child who is a multilingual learner who is suspected to have an exceptionality, there's also LRE to consider, right? And that's a big part of special education. Um, MTSS, multi-tiered system of support, is a comprehensive framework designed to address the academic, behavioral, and social emotional needs of each student in the most inclusive and equitable learning environment possible. That framework is driven by strong leadership, policies and practices, family and community engagement, staff collaboration, and data-informed decision-making. And Tracy Whitlock um, on the Aussie team, her team is doing some professional development specific to MTSS. So if you would like some more information on the MT, uh, on MTSS in Maine, that is um, a great place to go for that. And I think they're starting, I think it's, you know what, I'm not sure. So I don't want to, um, to inadvertently mislead you. So if you have questions about that, you can look in our professional development calendar um, or you could email Tracy Whitlock and she can help you out with that. So there is a flow chart in the manual um, that goes through intervention procedures for multilingual learners. And it goes through all of the steps. Um, you know, one of the things that we really need to think about is that we wanna make sure that the, the student has consistent instructional strategies with the classroom teacher and the ESOL teacher, and that if there are absences, that's going to interrupt their pro their their progress. So we just need to keep that you know in, in mind that that team and that collaboration that you know work around the student is a big piece of how the student can be successful. So the first piece of the intervention procedure is to ensure that the child is receiving culturally and linguistically responsive instruction, where the teacher's using instructional strategies for integrated language and content acquisition. The teacher should be um, attempting a progression of instructional strategies to resolve the student's academic challenges, and that those challenges and strategies and interventions should be documented um, as the student's progress and progress and their behavior. Um, and you should also be looking at documenting the contact 
of the parent and guardians um, so that they are heavily involved in the process and that you are using a qualified interpreter if needed. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit um, further along about the importance of using a professional interpreter rather than a family member um, to, to help you interpret information when you're communicating with the family. And Robin, what, what can you add to that? I'm sure you have lots. Well, I do, but I guess I just wanna bring up something that um has actually come up a number of times this year, and that's um, when you have a curriculum, I'm going to pick on math right now, um, and particularly at the elementary level, and it's a new curriculum, and, and the teachers have been asked to um, follow the teacher's guide to, to the letter um, and not uh, go off script. Um, but you really have to think about the needs of all of your students. And uh, if you need to have conversations with um, your administrators or your department heads about um, use, using that curriculum, but also providing the student with what they need. So for example, an English learner may need more repetition of vocabulary or may need to have additional um, visuals um, or manipulatives uh, or fewer examples to deal with. Um, some of those modifications um, might be very similar to what would be happening for a student that has an IEP in the room. Um, but it, when, it, when you have an IEP, it's a requirement. When you have an ILAP, it's sort of a recommendation. Um, but it's a strong recommendation. <laughs> and I just encourage everybody to really um, think about what each student needs um, when you are having to work within um, something that's very scripted. You know, and, and I would add, Robin, that what we're talking about as a step one, when we're looking at accommodations, modifications, we're really looking at universal design for learning. We're looking at, you know, really good teaching in the classroom. And, and I know that that is particularly challenging right now um, in schools where there's, you know, um, lack of staff, lots more kids, um, time constraints. Um, but when we're really looking at you know, UDL, that's that's good teaching. And that's really what this step one piece is about. So the teacher looks at, you know, their progress monitoring, how they've been intervening with the student, um, how they've been collaborating with the ESOL teacher. Um, and then if there's still concerns, the teacher would request assistance from the school team. So you should know who this, who your team is that you would talk to um, if you have continued concerns about a student and are considering a referral. Robin? And your language um, acquisition committee uh, should really be um, considered one of those teams. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and that um, the people involved in that team is laid out in the Lao plan that we referred to um, at the beginning, that school policy. Uh, and each district um, writes that a little bit differently, but it always includes the um, classroom teachers, the um, ESOL teacher, the parents, um, the student when appropriate, and then any other support staff that may be um, involved in the child's education. Um, each district decides if they want an administrator there or not. It's not a requirement that an administrator be there. So that's a little different from an IEP. Perfect. Okay, step three is that this, the team will develop an intervention plan, monitor the student's response to the intervention, and follow up meetings to, to, to see whether that intervention plan is successful, is it working, or um, is there a suspected disability here? 
Um, and I believe I could be wrong, Robin, but I believe that the intervention plan best practice would be to um, have those consistent interventions at least three times a week with follow-up meetings roughly every two weeks in order to revise the plan if, it, if, if revision is needed, to adapt the plan if it's needed. Um, and the team would really want to do it um, a hard look at the student process uh, and their progression through the plan at the six week mark if the service delivery has been consistent and the uh, team has been able to collect information from the family and explore socio-cultural factors. You're right on, Leora. Awesome. All right, and step four, You've, you've done these things together. You've had these plans, you've had the intervention plan, you've had, you have your data point and the student is still not making progress as expected. So this is where the team is like, okay, we, we suspect that there's a disability here. So we need to, um, we need to look at the special education referral process. And Robin, did you want to add anything with that? No, we're good. Okay. So just a reminder that um, steps one to three of the intervention process as outlined in the guidance manual are on pages six to 14, and they should be completed before the school team requests an assessment to be completed in a primary home language or in English. Um, you know, just like Muser, we wanna make sure that we have done what we can for that student in the least restrictive environment before um, making the decision to evaluate. So there are three different ways that you can evaluate a multilingual learner. The first is that you could do the entire evaluation in their primary home language. Um, ideally with a bilingual staff member or with the assistance of a trained interpreter. So that's where the, the evaluation is done in, in their home language. Um, the second way is that you could do the evaluation in both their primary home language and in English. Um, and keep in mind that bilingual testing could require concurrent presentation of test items and directions in both languages. So in that situation, it's very likely that a trained interpreter would be involved as well. And the third way that a um, multilingual learner can be evaluated is just in English. And I know that Robin has things to talk about here. Well, as, as most of you are probably aware, there are very few um, tests or assessment instruments that are available in languages other than English and Spanish. Uh, so that's where the insistence of a trained um, interpreter um, becomes uh, critical. Um, and again, it depends, it, the evaluator has to make the decision about what types of assessments are needed. Uh, and then time has to be spent with the interpreter um, so that the evaluator's expectations um, are made clear to the interpreter. Uh, and so that involves some investment of time before the actual assessment um, is given. Um, and, and so it, it is a real struggle for our evaluators um, because they don't have um, many options in other languages available to them. There is something called the Bilingual Verbal Ability Test. And it is standardized and it's available in several languages and it is listed uh, in the guidance manual. One of the issues with that evaluation is that they have not updated it. So the pictures, some of them that are used, like there's a candelabra and oh a stage and yeah, and a stagecoach. I mean, you know, so, Again, that's one of those assessments where, 
you can get an idea if the student understands um, and can produce words that are opposites, antonyms or synonyms. Um, but it, it's just like you, you can't just take it as a standardized score. Um, so even that, that, that I mean, that's, they haven't updated it. So evaluators are even beginning to question if it's even worth doing that one. Hmm. So some variables to consider when you are evaluating multilingual learners for a possible disability. Um, the first is the, their primary home language and literacy skills. What are their skills in that primary home language? How did the language development occur? And getting that, and that information really comes from that parent interview. Um, what are their English language and literacy skills? Are there any cultural factors that could possibly influence test and school performance? What's the family history? You know, we, we talk about that interrupted learning piece. What's the child's educational history? Have they even ever been in um, a formal school setting? And have, have they had any previous reading instruction at all? Maybe they have, maybe they haven't, depending on that um, potentially interrupted educational history. Do you want to add anything, Robin? No, I think you said it all. Okay. So some extrinsic values to consider when evaluating the multilingual learners for possible disabilities, physical factors, psychological factors, personal factors, and family history. And again, this is information that you're likely, the parents are going to be the best um, sources of this information for you through that parent interview. I'll just add a little piece in here where <laughs> one time at a kindergarten registration, uh, there was a, a child that um, was presenting um, with several challenges, but in the parent interview, um, we asked uh, mom if this little one's development had been um, comparable to the other siblings because um, because mom thought that he was everything was fine and and he he looked great and she said yes you know he developed just the way his siblings and there were several siblings in the family um, we later found out um this is a family that moved in and whatever and once records came in that the older siblings were arriving with ieps and needed significant support um, so, you know, that was sort of an interesting, um, factor there to, to, to weigh in and that mom wasn't trying to cover anything up, but it, you know, that's just how it worked, <laughs> worked out in that family. Well, and, and she was answering your question literally, right? You yes. asked her if, the ch if, if he developed like his siblings and the answer was yes. Right, right. Yeah, there was just that large piece of, of missing information that um, that was pretty integral to to seeing the whole full uh, picture of things. Yeah. 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 So other considerations uh, are medical considerations. Does the child have a visual impairment, a hearing develop uh, impairment? Pardon me. Are there developmental delays? Are there speech delays? Is there a chronic illness? What's the child's me medical history? And super duper important is, is there or has there been exposure to trauma? And so many of the students who are coming into this country have had exposure to trauma. Um, so we need to take all of these things into consideration and um, just make sure that um, you know, we're, we're trying to get the, the fullest picture of, of the student that we possibly can. So we're going to end up, oh, sorry, Robin, did I interrupt you? No, I just wasn't fast enough on the button there. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, our children that are coming from refugee situations or who have, you know, like, walked from, you know, the uh, continent of, you know, left the continent of Africa 
and coming through South America and, you know, walked through horrible situations, um, you know, some of them have really untreated medical uh, situations. Uh, and because of just the way the whole system is set up, um, they come to school before they've even had good medical evaluation. Uh, and quite often it's through the school health um, providers that we help families get connected um, to get some help for these medical conditions. Um, you know, we have children who are diabetic that the way they were able to keep going was, you know, pocketfuls of candy, uh, that type of thing. So just to, that's just a little note to consider, um, particularly with, with that um, group of um, families coming in that way. Absolutely. I just want to point out too that we're not even halfway through with our slide deck and we only have 10 minutes left. So um, we're going to kind of rush through some slides and then I'll for just a couple more minutes and then I'll skip to the end and there will be a QR code if you um, use your smart device and Carly will also put the link into the um, chat box for you as well then you will get a copy of this PowerPoint, Muser, the procedural manual, um, and a contact hour for today as well. Just make sure that you type in your email address correctly, and then all of those goodies will, will come to your inbox automatically for you. So I just wanted to say that because we are going to end up running out of time, I think. And just select today's date. Uh -huh. um, for the training so that you get all the correct contact hour in slide deck PDF information. Yes, so 215. Make sure to make sure to do the correct date. Okay, so assessment protocols and tests used in schools that are typically designed for proficient English speakers. And we know this, and there is cultural and linguistic bias. Um, there's not, and when we're talking about um, administering assessments and evaluations to multilingual learners, then it, it very likely could be non standard administration. So um, it's important that the evaluator. Um, makes note of that information in their report. Um, so as we go through the assessment piece, um, best practice would be that if the child gives the correct answer to a question on, on an evaluation that is, is accepted, whether it's in the home language or in English. Um, document any non-standard administration. So um, that again could be that you're accepting the the correct answer in both the, the home language and in English. Um, the standard scores may not be the only data point used and, and must be regarded as only one part of the evaluation. So the information that's collected as part of um, the the process leading up to a potential referral, that data is all going to be taken into consideration as well during during the referral process. And Robin, what what would you like to add? No, I'm good. Okay. So I'm gonna go over this piece and then I'm gonna skip to the end so I don't keep you guys longer. This is that dynamic assessment piece. And again, we had, um, we, we asked MASS, the main association for school psychologists, to look at the guidebook, especially the dynamic assessment piece, because this was um, new to us. So this is a supplemental approach to traditional norm referenced and standardized assessments. Um, they could be um, graduated prompting, test, teach, retest. Um, of those, 
potential interventions, it's thought that the test teach retest is best suited for differenti differentiating language differences from disorders. Um, and the dynamic assessment should be in compliance with regulations as outlined in MUSER and in conjunction with standardized administration. Dynamic assessment can be used as a method for obtaining a more comprehensive understanding of a student's strengths and needs. Um, and if you would like more information about dynamic assessment, there's a link in the manual to the American Speech Language Hearing Association Association's webpage, and there are four learning modules on the approach of dynamic assessment that you can um, that you can uh, access and, and look at if you aren't sure about what dynamic assessment is or how it can be um, used during evaluations. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead quickly. Um, and again, all of this information is will be, as long as you fill out the QR code, you will get all this information. Um, Robin, do you want to speak to the cultural language interpretive matrix? Well, it was uh, developed by Dr. Samuel Ortiz, and um, this is used by the um, evaluators, our psychologists, um, to look at the standardized tests and, and there's a, a factoring in the linguistic and cultural pieces. And it, it's a little formula that um, the assessors apply to the um, standardized score. And it, it's, it's had a lot of research. And um, I, I know a lot of our evaluators in Maine do apply that um, in their evaluating process. Thank you. All right, I again, I'm going to skip ahead because I want to make sure the IEP team meeting, it's important that um, the IEP team is comprised of folks, including the ESOL teacher and an interpreter. Um, so that the parents can uh, understand and contribute to the conversation. Um, but the eligibility piece is, is exactly the same as with any um, student who is who potentially has an exceptionality. Um, you would fill out an adverse effect form, either the adverse effect on education, um, the specific learning disability at, um, eligibility form, or the speech and language disability form, uh, eligibility form, in the same way that you would fill it out for any other student. Um, the IEP team needs to um, take into consideration the ESOL teacher's expertise so that that is part of the IEP process itself. And I very quickly, when we develop the IEP, it should include um, references in section six to the ILAP. And I'm just, so this is, this is great. When you have some extra time, this, com this table compares the IEP and the ILAP, and you'll be able to see what the overlap is, which in it's, it's very interesting, but this is really what I wanted to, to show you very quickly. Um, section six of the IEP is where you would document that the child has an ILAP. <laughs> Pardon me. The English uh, pardon me, the English language acquisition plan. And you can see that our guidance is that it would be used in both special education and general education as needed, and that the dates um, would coincide with the dates of the IEP itself. I also want to point out super quick that there are translated special education documents on our website. Um, we did um, a project where we found um, in Massachusetts special education term glossaries and had them translated into Arabic, Mandarin, Khmer, Somali, Vietnamese, Portuguese, French, and Spanish. Um, and there are translated procedural safeguards as well. 
except for those are not in Portuguese as of yet. Um, but those documents, those translated documents can be found um, at, at that link on our DOE website. And there's a section about FAQs and case studies. I'm going to blow through this super quick and I'm going to just get to here's the QR code. So um, I believe that Carly put this in the chat box as well for you folks. Um, and we apologize that we did not finish everything today. If you have questions, you have our email and we are happy to assist you. Robin, what would you like to, to, um, to add? I'd just like to add that um, it should be dual services. If a student yes, is identified, it's not either or, and that's a myth out there. Um, so that, and also when you are setting up the accommodations for testing, that you also consider the access test, which is a state test. And this testing window, we've had a lot of people um, contacting us that, oh, this student should have this. And, but if it's not in an IEP, it can't be used on the language proficiency test. Um, so that's, again, your ESOL teacher should be sharing that information at the IEP about what's needed there. We are one minute over, and I apologize to all of you guys. Uh, we appreciate you hanging out with us for office hours today. Robin, we very much appreciate your participation and your sharing your expertise. It's been a pleasure to work with you, and I look forward to continuing our partnership. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right, guys, I am going to close the meeting. So everyone have a good rest of your day.